Okay, this is me with John Pertwee, the third doctor, and a Cyberman in Bessie, the third doctor's car, when I was nine years old. So it's fair to say this was a pretty big deal for me. Oh, this is so much better. We got up at 6 a.m. to do that because we thought there'd be no people about, and it turns out there are actually quite a lot of people about on the seafront at 6 a.m., so. <sighs> if I wasn't excited enough with this being Doctor Who, um, the team showed me really early on the proof of concept that they'd done, which was a scene set outside in a graveyard with the Weeping Angels, um, with the, the whole mechanic of you turn around and you see them and then you don't face them and they, they come at you, and. It, God, it was scary, but it was brilliant. It looked amazing, sounded amazing, really immersive, and it just felt like you were in the middle of an episode. So I knew from the start it was going to be a pretty good project. With Doctor Who being this massive institution of a thing, it's nearly 60 years old now, it was really important to honour that legacy um, and, and respect the fact that this was kind of an official thing. It was a pro it's proper BBC Doctor Who. It's got uh, the TARDIS, Weeping Angels, um, Daleks. It's got the Doctor herself, Jodie Whittaker's in it. Uh, and we had to make it sound like it would fit in, ideally, as, as if it were an episode of the most recent series, uh, series 13, I think, of, of the new series. Um, and with any other show, that would mean zeroing in on the specifics of what instrumentation did they use, uh, how is it produced, what is the kind of stock sound of that programme, uh, because a lot of them have a very, very kind of narrowly defined soundscape or, or, you know, a certain type of instrumentation that is used. But Doctor Who, never mind the last 60 years, the last season has such a breadth of, of music in it from Sagan Akinola. There's a traditional... Indian instrumentation and vocals, there's um, big orchestral stuff, there's um, small-scale chamber stuff, solo instruments, uh, electronics and, and stretched sound design and weird things. So the palette, the, the kind of toy box that I had to work with was massive to start with, which is both a good thing because it means you can do, you know, almost anything you want, uh, and a bad thing in the sense that it's such a a wide canvas, it can be a bit daunting to know how to make a start versus, you know, knowing you're going to use a string quartet and that's one of the questions answered. So one way that I was able to focus in, despite having this huge sound palette to work with, was to pick the different areas of the game um, and give each one a kind of personality. Right at the start of the game you find yourself in a, a laundrette, um, like present day Earth, and uh, the score for that bit is quite classic series. There's lots of um, synth stuff, there's a kind of smattering of, of the small little woodwind ensembles that you find in the classic series when they had a really limited budget and they only had like three or four players. Um, and the synth stuff I used mostly, um, at least for the beginning, I used mostly virtual recreations of the actual hardware synths that they used on the show in the 70s and 80s. Um, why do they use virtual versions and not the real versions? Yeah, we didn't quite have the budget for a, a CS80 and um, all the rest of it, but they sound amazing and they do exactly what we needed to on this, which was make it sound like Doctor Who and be authentic. The music for the TARDIS has its own sound as well. Um, whenever you're in the TARDIS, the music that's playing will have percussion that's made from uh, the actual TARDIS set in Cardiff. So our uh, Creative director Marcus was doing a bit of a recce to the new TARDIS set on, uh, in Cardiff. So I asked him if he could get some video and audio of that set, just pulling levers and moving cranks and, and switching buttons and stuff. And he sent that over to me. I got that audio file and I chopped out every single little sound, every ratchet and click and squeak. I mapped all of those across the keyboard. So now I've got this percussion instrument that I can play and every single sound is sound from the TARDIS. Now, I don't expect people 
to play the game and listen to that and go, oh, that's one of the levers from the TARDIS. We're not doing it because it sounds like the TARDIS. I'm doing it because it's a nice way of finding an in. I talked before about the palette, the sound palette being so wide that how do you find, you know, your initial sound world or, or your theme or your way into the piece. Things like that are a really nice way of kind of sparking things off creatively. So now I've got this unique percussion instrument that nobody else on the planet has and that is the kind of thing that will spark off ideas. Another thing I did uh, in a similar vein was to take one of Jodie's lines. So I took a line where Jodie introduces herself as the Doctor uh, and stretched it out to almost infinity using granular synthesis. Uh, and again, I mapped that across the keyboard and, and put some reverb and some effects on it. So now we have um, a pad synth sound that I use when Jodie's talking, either where, when we're in the TARDIS and she's giving us instructions or when we're out and about trying to save the world and she's helping us out, you will hear that sound. And again, you won't hear it and think, oh, Jodie Whittaker's singing, or <laughs> the Doctor's singing at me. It's just another way of giving things an identity, giving the TARDIS its own sound, giving Jodie's bits of exposition and encouragement a sound. And it could have been a preset. It could have been a preset on a synth and it might have worked the same. But I get more, more of a creative spark and more fun and more joy and I think more originality out of doing things like this, out of playing with it and seeing you know, what cool sounds we can come up with. Stick a few other things on, a bit of piano, a bit of solo cello and uh, you get some TARDIS music. Later on, we spend some time in Manfred Grail's Victorian dressing room. Um, uh, he's very old school, he's very kind of British and aristocratic, so I wanted to go uh, play on that and do something a bit more orchestral and, and thematic. Um, it's a bit more mysterious to start with because you're not quite sure where you are. It looks like London, but something's a bit off. And then for Grail's exposition, we go a bit more gothic and pompous. Before things all start to get a bit creepy. At some point, I'm not going to give away when, uh, you run into the Daleks. Now, I wrote this... Um, this little kind of fragment of a motif for the Daleks. That's it, right? This tiny little thing. It's a really simple chromatic thing based on a fifth. That's the fifth. Um, augmented. Diminished. So it's this kind of, it's, it's melodic and dissonant um, and really neat and self-contained and I can do a lot with it. So this, this little idea around the, the fifth, um, Originally, on, on my mock-ups, when I was doing all of this virtually with, um, with the, the fake instruments, that was all on low brass, low strings, um, to give this kind of weight and, and depth. And I changed it because I thought, partly because I thought that had been done before, done very well, but, but that had been done before, a lot of Murray Gold stuff. Um, he, he did that kind of thing orchestrally uh, and a lot of choir as well but I decided that I wanted all the Dalek stuff in the edge of time to be synth I wanted every st I didn't want any real instruments let alone orchestra so all of the time that you are um, interacting with uh, I don't want to give anything away all the time that you are interacting with or around Daleks you uh, will only ever hear synth music the drums the the leads, the rhythms, everything will be purely electronic because I just felt that gave it a bit of a unique flavour and it kind of 
fix the, uh, the environment and, and the stuff that you get up to then. And talking of the Daleks, that is um, a good example of how the music in the game is reactive. So if you play um, a video game, you're not going to play it exactly the same time and make exactly the same decisions. You could come out of the TARDIS and go straight to the spaceship. Or you could come out of the TARDIS and have a look at the scenery and kind of wander about a bit and have a cup of tea and then end up at the UFO spaceship thing half an hour later. And the music has to be able to react to the first person who's whizzing through and doing everything really quickly, but also be exactly as effective for the second person who's spending a lot more time doing stuff without sounding repetitive and without sounding like you're suddenly, you know, cutting one piece of music off and starting another one. So that's one of the challenges is to make things on a horizontal level to make things kind of smooth and reactive. So whatever you're doing and however long you're taking to do it, it sounds cohesive and it sounds like a, a film score as much as it can. And then an added layer of complication to this whole, you know, music's different depending on how you play the game is not just horizontal, it's vertical. So when you are uh, in the Daleks territory, um, they can either be completely unaware of you or they can be, they've got an idea that you might be there and they're kind of searching, they're on alert. And then the third stage is they've seen you and they know you're there and they're gonna try and exterminate you. So the music um, ramps up and down depending on uh, what stage the Daleks at. And then later on, we find ourselves on Metabilis 4. Uh, I had to look that one up. I couldn't remember which one it was. Um, and the synths are back, but uh, instead of the Dalek, brittle, digital sounding, cold, sterile synths, we, uh, we went with some kind of expansive, analog sounding, warm synths, um, which really suit the mood. It's quite a monasterial, is that a word, monasterial? It's kind of, religious themes, quite tranquil and peaceful at least to start with. So we went with this kind of washy, old school analog synth vibe. There is tons more that I could talk about. Uh, there's about two hours, I think, maybe more, of original music here and most of it is in the soundtrack. So if, uh, if you like this stuff and you want to hear more, check out the soundtrack or get the game. Play the game, it's brilliant. But I'm going to finish by talking about the most important theme in the whole game, which is the Doctor's theme. Now, there's a thing in music called a leitmotif, and that kind of really started getting used in Doctor Who from, from 2005, when Murray Gold started. And a leitmotif is an operatic device where characters and... Um, and ideas and settings have their own little musical treatments, whether it's a theme or a motif or an instrument or something. There's, there's a thing that signifies death or this character or the outdoor world or, you know, tension. And Murray was brilliant at that. He was just a genius with melody and he, I think the, pretty much the first thing you hear in, in the first episode of, of the relaunch in, in 2005 was that... Um, uh. Something like that. really balls that up, but it's that kind of thing. Donna's theme, obviously he also wrote themes for the Doctors. There was uh, this one, I think both the ninth and 10th Doctors had this theme. one, which is probably the most well-known one. And then uh, P3, 
Peter Capaldi's theme, which was a lot slower. It was more kind of Batman Begins. And then Sega Nakanola took over for Jodie's first season and he gave her a brilliant theme. So the challenge was to write a theme that fits in with the rest of the score, sounds like it belongs in the series, is flexible enough to be used in different ways, to be kind of melodic and lyrical and positive, but also a bit more actiony, but also doesn't sound like any existing theme for any other Doctor. Ooh. There are a lot of melodies in this score. There's, the, there's that mini uh, Dalek theme. Uh, there's Emma's theme. Grail's theme as well. There's also a motif for the first who keeps popping up, uh, no spoilers, as you progress through the game, um, which is this, uh, it's more of a motif than a, f a fully fledged theme, but that's, uh, it's this little thing. Um. Which you'll hear a lot, either big or small or, solo instruments or um, ensembles. So there's a lot of melodic stuff in the score and never normally a problem to come up with melodies, but I did have to think a lot about this particular theme, the one for the Doctor. Uh, eventually I went with um, a 3-4 time, a waltz feeling, uh, starting with three notes that would signify the major scale to kind of reflect the, um, the 13th Doctor's really kind of optimistic, hopeful um, outlook. And I wanted to capture that in the theme, so uh, I ended up in E, E major. And then harmonically, I like the idea of, of contrary motion, which is where one part of the music goes down and one part of the music goes up, or vice versa. And uh, I ended up coming up with this um which I liked it's quite flexible and could be used for a theme um but the trouble with this is it sounds nice, but it sounds really obvious. And I think it's nice to have something that sounds obvious because the ear expects it to do what it's gonna do, but then put in something that's a little bit more unexpected. Uh, and in the case of the theme, I went to this chord. And then back to the E again. So you've got this kind of almost like romantic sounding progression between the two chords. Um, and it's a little bit otherworldly too when the, the melody goes in. So the, the melody um, sounds like this.
just really sculpting it to a point where I felt it was familiar enough, different enough from everything else, sounded enough like me, and was evocative enough of what I was trying to do with it and, and communicate with it. So th there was a lot of um, very fine adjustments to get it to where it, it ends up in game. And we end up with this theme that can be played as a sort of semi-folky melodic thing with, with a bit of an otherworldly edge. Um, So it's simple, but not simplistic, which is a brilliant maxim. I saw uh, Austin Wintory, who's a phenomenal composer, um, explaining something about one of his recent scores, and he, he said he aims for his melodies to be simple, but not simplistic, and I think that's a really good kind of thing to have in your head when you're writing something like this. So we have that version of the theme. We add a few things, a bit of synth, uh, a bass, solo cello, played beautifully across the whole score as well by Darren Cullen uh, and an orchestra who are the Macedonian radio orchestra who I've used before on stuff and they're always fantastic. With uh, the orchestral stuff on this project I was helped out with orchestration and score prep by the fabulous Tristan Noon, thank you Tristan, who made sure everything was nicely balanced um, and as clear as possible for the sessions. So here's what it sounds like the first time I think, the first time that you hear the Doctor's theme in the game. This is what it sounds like with uh, cello and orchestra and piano and, and other bits. The contrary motion thing the reason I liked that is because that is strong enough on its own without needing the melody to support it and we could use that when uh, we needed something a bit more upbeat and actiony and we didn't want a melody to get in the way either because it would get too repetitive or because maybe there's there's VO or there's a load of sound effects and the melody would get lost so we needed something kind of to have something driving, but still reference the Doctor's theme is a really useful thing to have. And here's what it sounds like with uh, <laughs> the kitchen sink thrown at it. <laughs> 